Testing this mic. Testing this mic. Hi, folks. How are we doing today? Everybody here and see me? Hi, Taran, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Can you hear and see me all right? Yep. Okay, and I can hear and see you. So that's all excellent. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. And uh, if you're ready, we'll just go ahead and, and uh, get ready to go with this, this talk and interview. You're in uh, Helsinki right now? That's right. How is the conference uh, going? Well, we've just had the reception, so it's nice to catch up with some old friends and uh, some of your former colleagues, I believe, uh, I've uh, seen today. And um, yeah, no, it's good. I mean, it's been a long time, thanks to Corona, that I've seen some of them. Yeah, I was looking at the program. It was really a who's who of old Norse. Yeah, um, though there are some big, big, the old guard uh, are missing this year mostly. So that's a bit of a shame. But um, I think Corona, yeah, I mean, it, it stops some people from traveling for good reasons, I think. Sure. Yeah. Well, everyone, welcome to our uh, Patreon interview for August 7th, 2022. Uh, our guest today comes to us from the Dictionary of Old Norse Prose at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, Dr. Wills is one of the editors there. So will you start off by telling us a little bit about your own professional background, about what you do at the dictionary, maybe a little bit about the background of the dictionary itself? Yep. Yep. Uh, well, I studied in Sydney uh, back when Old Norse was a big thing there, um, and uh, I guess, like most of us, we, you know, we like old things, but then we get into the field because it is great literature, and, um, you know, I, I love the sagas, I love the poetry, and, you um, and I think, you know, Iceland has this special place as the kind of Hollywood of early Scandinavia, the place where the old stories were being retold in a new way and where new stories were being uh, put also, you know, being made in a, a way that people wanted to have at the time. So that's what I love about it. And that's why it's kept me going through all of it. But uh, most of most of my career, uh, I've been working on skaldic poetry uh, so the the poetry um, the, the main form of poetry that was being recorded in these things uh, and um, but with an interest in computing stuff um, and uh, more recently moving into the lexicographic side so the dictionaries so I started uh, in Copenhagen on a dictionary of poetry, which hadn't been done since the 1930s and mm. still hasn't been finished yet. These things take a long time. Uh, and then I moved over to the prose dictionary, which is where I'm working now. And I'm, I'm head of that project and uh, it's been going a long time. Historical dictionaries take a long time and they take a lot of work, uh, um, uh, but we're getting there and, um, you know, that's what I'm here to talk about today. Absolutely. When you say a long time, if I recall right, I think that the, uh, the register and introduction to the project might have been published in 1989. Is that right? That's right. And that was 50 years after <laughs> the project started. <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, to be fair, they didn't have much money for the first uh, 40 years or so. There was just two guys, basically. The way you make these dictionaries, or at least the way you made them in the old days, is that you had to actually physically read through everything written in Old Norse and choose the words that you wanted. And so the first 40 years, is there were two guys that basically did that. They read everything, what they couldn't get uh, in print. They they edited themselves uh, and uh, and collected this um, massive uh, card index of, of citations from the corpus that then became the base of the dictionary. 
and I've benefited from that card corpus. It is it is an enormous enormous project. How, how many people are working there now? Well, we've got we've got about ten most of the time. Uh, there are four or five full time editors. Um, so, uh, which are the backbone of the project, uh, and um, and they they you know tend to be very experienced scholars and very dedicated to their work. I mean, it takes a certain sort of very rigorous and detailed person to spend their life's work going through and trying to work out what every word of Old Norse means in every context, um, but. Uh, yeah, so the so it's a it's a nice it's a little team, but it's nice. We've got everyone from students to people who are basically retired and and still working for us part time. So it's a nice mix. And what does your day at the dictionary look like? What is a what is a work day oh. for you? What kind of tasks are you are you? <laughs> I mean, maybe that's too big of a question. No, 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 no. It's a good question. It's a good. I, I, my ideal day would involve um, sitting down, dealing with you know the inevitable kind of administrative things that make sure that everyone has a job and gets paid and everything. Um, and, but um, the the work of the dictionary is basically you sit down. We we divide up the words that need to be edited. And you just go through every citation one by one. Um, so we have, um, so you, you, you uh, I can't even, I've just come back from my summer holiday, so I can't even remember what I'm working on at the moment. But basically, <laughs> you go through, you read a sentence, and you decide what the word means. You use old dictionaries, maybe translations, things like that. Uh, and then, you know, once you've been through all of them, you have a collection of, of different meanings that come out of the sentences from the, the, the text that you're reading. And, um, and then you divide those up into, you know, you might decide, well, that's more or less the same meaning as that. So we'll put those together. Uh, and that's how you end up with a dictionary entry that basically you've, someone's just decided this word should be taken into account. And we've decided what it means. We do the definitions in Danish and English. I do my, I do them in English, uh, and then someone will come and do the Danish definitions. But they're also reading it because it's not just a matter of translating the definition from English to Danish or back. You have to understand what the word means in the sentence. Of course. So um, yeah. So we've got. Yeah, I mean, over 800,000 sentences that we have to read and um, and there's at least three sets of eyes that, um, that that kind of go through that to make that decision. So it's time consuming, but it's, um, but it's also great because one of the things, I mean, I think as a, a, both a student and a teacher of Old Norse is that you tend to choose the texts that you think are interesting hmm. and then present them or work on them. But here you just... You don't get a choice, you know. The word, the the words are there. You just and you get to so you get to read all sorts of literature that you never thought you might. So there's a lot of religious literature. There's a lot of translated literature, you know, where people are trying to translate concepts from French or high sure. or low German or something into Old Norse. And sometimes they'll use a word that they have. They'll make up a new word. Those sorts of things. So you get you get to you get everything, everything in prose in in Old Norse. Uh, I've seen, <laughs> and it's uh, yeah, it's quite and an it, interesting. It it is a lot more and a lot more genres than many people anticipate. You know, we we see a lot of the same sagas, um, Heimskringla, things like that. But yeah, you get into like, you know, some of these strange geographical works or medical works or or saints' lives or or. or you know, weird medieval encyclopedic kind of works. Yeah, that's a, yeah. It's, it's a totally different, well, in, in some ways, I mean, the vocabulary you're encountering is is going to be extremely different from what you're going to see in a narrative. And yeah. you might get a lot of hot boxes that way, especially if someone is translating something that's pretty yeah. unique. Uh, so where are you doing this? Is it in, are, I mean, are you using shared documents or is there, what, what kind of program do you use for editing these entries? Well, we have a database. So the dictionary 
the dictionary went down the database route already in the 80s. Uh, and then I suppose it was in the 90s that they switched to uh, Oracle, which is, a, which is a server based one. So basically, everyone's working on the same data set. Uh, some of them are using an older program that just runs in Windows, where they basically got a list of the citations and they're making the definitions and putting in little codes to fit them to the definitions and so on. Uh, we've also got a web-based interface where you can actually do it in a little bit more of a webby way and just sort of drag the citations around and type things into the page if you're logged in. It's actually basically the same as the uh, website that you see as a, as a normal user, but then when you log in, you can actually edit the material there. Oh, I see. Uh, and that's how we have, so we have students typing in the citations, we have, uh, uh, you know, a research assistant who's supplementing the citations from, from older dictionaries and other things, and then the editors are going in and, uh, and actually doing the, making the decisions about what the words mean, and then checking each other's work and all of those sorts of things that you do in these projects. And how is it decided that an entry is done, right? How how do how do you or the other editors say this is this is ready to be seen by the public? Uh, it's been looked over by our our most experienced editor. Basically, she says that's all right. Uh, so you know, like these projects, and I've had a similar experience with the Skaldic project too. They can be brutal. I mean, you know. Because basically our tolerance for error in a project like this is pretty close to zero. Mm. We do not want to have something with O and P at the top of that that's wrong. Right. Uh, so that means that uh, you need some eagle-eyed people going through it and, you know, and giving you pretty honest feedback. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I've, I've, I, I used to hate this sort of thing, but now I love it. You know, the idea that you kind of you can learn so much from so experienced people who who aren't you know just trying to be polite. Uh, they just tell you, no, that's wrong. You you know, lift your game. You get this stuff wrong all the time, or you know that sort of thing. Um, so you know, I, it's a, a constant learning process, and I, I expect I'll still be learning stuff until I'm seventy years old. Well, and I'm, I'm I'm sort of hogging the questions here, but I'm I'm very curious about this this creator end of the project, right? For the for the editors, um, and and I'll I'll try to hold myself to one more question about this before I uh, open this up a little bit more. But um, I'm curious: Have you learned anything about the language that stands out to you from your work at the dictionary? you know, realize something didn't mean what you thought or, or realize that, you know, Old Norse was, was in some way a different language than you thought, just from how deep you dive into these words? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I wish I had a good example just to pull out. But one of the things I suppose I, you know, you, you notice, well, the thing I've really learned is just how many loan words come in uh, from other languages, so words that that have been adapted to Old Norse, uh, and the the Low German influence is something that the, because I was kind of focusing on earlier literature that you don't see, um, but but that gives this, this wonderful connection to modern Icelandic, for example, and the other Scandinavian languages where Low German because. You know, like Iceland and, and Norway and Denmark and Sweden, they were part of this this kind of trading world that was very much focused on the north of Germany uh, as its core. So, and you know, a lot of the the language uh, and cultural influences come from there in the the fifteenth century and and beyond. So, you know, that's that's one of the things that's really interesting that it's. You know, we we like traditionally people have seen Old Norse as this kind of pure ancient language, but you know, like any language, it's it's constantly changing and borrowing from other places, and it's it's what really makes it kind of rich and and interesting that you you know you can. I've sometimes been surprised looking at texts from the 1400s, 1500s, some of the Low German words that you'll see that you don't see in modern Icelandic. Because the language has 
gone through a kind of mm. uh, reform. Yeah, then purified again. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, B- Bitala instead of Greda mm. or something like that, or Gyalda. That's uh, it, it's it's funny when you look back at it and it looks more like Danish then than it does now, <laughs> just because yeah. of the, that level of of low German influence. And the, I mean, the other thing too is we we're using the text, like the spellings from the manuscript too, wherever we can, at least. And uh, yeah, and there's a lot of there's a lot of changes that were happening in the language in that time, you know, like spelling the long e sound, which is now pronounced ye. Uh, i.e. how it's pronounced mm-hmm. but of course then when the spelling was kind of codified and reformed they spelt it not how it was sounding but how it was uh, how it would have been spelt in you know the, the 13th century the sort of classical period of Old Norse those sorts of things are kind of interesting too that Icelandic has been sort of codified in this period of the 13th century so it looks like that even though it was already changing uh, a lot before it started being codified. Right. I've noticed that in one of my grad school jobs was I would translate funeral books for Icelandic descended families in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And some of these books were from the late 1700s or the 1800s. And and the spelling mm-hmm. is more phonetic in a sense, right? You see, yeah. you know, ye spelled J-E-G instead of long mm-hmm. E-G or something like that. Yeah, that's, and, and it is interesting just how consciously Icelandic has decided, or not the language itself decided, but how consciously it was decided to reform the spelling to make it look more like a medieval exemplar than an early yeah, modern yeah. one. Well, by the way, folks, feel free to throw in questions in the chat uh, as, as we go here. Don't let me hog this entire thing. But I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about the the dictionary from a user's perspective. Can yep. you walk us through a little bit of how to use this dictionary well? Because I think that sometimes the skill of using uh, a, a really good academic dictionary it, itself takes a little bit of learning. Yeah, there's a lot of information in there. But should I share my screen? And we sure, can... let, me, let me make you co-host so you can do that. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll just share the whole desktop do the normal blank face that one does when one is sharing the screen. There's a, there's <laughs> even, I think, a kind of TikTok video about the, uh, the professor's, uh, the professor's share screen face. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm it's sorry, I, I need to practice that, don't I? Um, okay, so it's a, it's a nice simple web address, which has disappeared because I've uh, full screened it, but it's just this one, ONP. Dictionary of Old Norse Prose at cool, K, KU Copenhagen University dot DK. Uh, and then the rest, the rest comes automatically. Um, so what you what you have is uh, like uh, just to try and take you directly into the dictionary, you have basically everything that you want to start with here. And the easiest thing is to look up a word. Does anyone have a word that you want me to look up? Or should I just pick one? I, a nice thing to start is there's a word okay. of the day. This is just chosen randomly. And the word of today is a hapax word, like a word that only occurs once anywhere. Uh, which is Atmungait, uh, meaning an eaglet clan, like a oh. clan of little eagles. It's a very strange word in a very strange context, um, somewhere in the back of uh, one of the King Saga manuscripts. Hmm. Um, so basically what you're looking at here is a very simple entry because there's only one citation. Uh, but as I've said, the definitions are based on what you see in the citations that come under it. So someone's gone through this um, and, um, and tried to work out what this, uh, this word means. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, because there was a guy that was found in a eagle's nest or something. <laughs> Awesome. And the, his family is then known as the Eaglet Clan. 
Um, you know, so you can sort of work out the, what it means from the context here, I suppose. Uh, this was edited a long time ago, so uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, that's an unusually um, kind of simple word. If you look at the the word, the second part, it, uh, meaning family, uh, you get an entry like this. Now, the first thing I'll say is we've done over half of the dictionary in Danish, uh, the, about 25% is in English. If you see something in Danish, you just click on it and you get Google to do the work for you. And I've tested this and it's about 90% not misleading. Um, okay, that's good for Google Translate. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not bad considering there's no context. Of course, you know, if it's a word that, um, that turns up that that has two quite different meanings in English. It uh, sometimes get it gets it completely wrong. But here, it, fortunately, it's worked for me. Um, so what you have is um, a a set of definitions, uh, and you can see what those are um, if you if you click on the entry structure. So you see just the just the the things that are there so you have a definition which is the family one and then there's an, a second one which means more of a gen generation or lineage than a, a family um and uh and so basically what you're doing here is if you want if you just want to look up what the word means then you can um, you, you look at the main definition and if that isn't right, you go further and further down the list to the more obscure meanings to find out what you think the word might mean. What can be quite interesting here is, um, well, for one thing, the chances for a word like this, which has 100, and, I think it was about 120 citations, the text you're reading when you look this up is probably already here. So someone's actually read the sentence. So it's it's actually about, I estimate about 7% of all the words that you're ever going to read in Old Norse have actually been, you will find the sentence in the dictionary. Hmm. Um, and if it's a more common word, it's less likely. If it's a less common word, then you're very likely to find it here. Uh, so, uh, so that's... Um, you know, that's useful to know, because if you're not sure what it means, you can actually look through them and find uh, the the actual sentence you're looking for. And you'll know that if it's in, um, I can't see this part of the screen, uh, if it's in the biblical translation, uh, then it's actually likely to have this sense of uh, generation. Interesting. The other and thing I'm, that... Hmm, I just want to know... Yeah, uh, in th that there's a gray, kind of grayish text in the middle of some of these entries that shows uh, what it's been translated from. Yeah, well, if it's a if it has some sort of foreign parallel, um, I was just going to say that myself. But um, so some of these things, like the uh, the STJ ones, the Stjorn uh, ones, a translation. It's a translation of the Bible. So we'll give the, the Vulgate, so the medieval Latin Bible uh, reference. Um, so, so here uh, you can see tribus, tribe, the, the tribe of Israel. It's translating. Um, and But, you know, quite different words if you look at it, which can be interesting too. In domotua, in your house, like in your house, in your family, and, and then we have the tribe again, uh, and semini, I don't know what that is. <laughs> My Latin isn't that great. Um, we have Latin experts on to sort out those things for us. Uh, yeah, so that's, um, so that's what you get there. Uh, if you click through, so if you if you are looking at it in Graugaus, for example, the Icelandic laws, you get a lot of information about each particular citation. So here is the text um, of the citation with the uh, with the definition that we had before, the edition that's taken from and the manuscript information, because every one of our citations, we know which manuscript it's come from and that information's here. 
You can see the text of the old edition in almost all cases. And you can see the actual original citation slip for all, um, all words that after H, uh, we have the scan slips. And there are links here to images of the manuscript too, if you want to go that far down. So yeah, there's a there's a lot of information there. So so if you you know if you're wondering about what a word means in a text, then you can look it up. You can look at if it's if it's there, and it might well be there. If it's an unusual sense, then then there's a lot of information about um, about the word and where it's coming from and, and what it means. Um, and once you get through to this stage too. You can also compare how the word is being used in other texts, and if there are other translations, how what other words it's it's translating them. I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot. I'm going to shut up now. No, this but, is uh, you talk. This is really what I what I wanted. I wanted to get a look at an entry with someone behind the scenes. This is exactly what I was looking for. Uh, actually, while while we were talking about what word to look up, uh, a few people asked to look at Drangur, always a fan favorite word <laughs> Drenger. that one yeah yeah so yeah if you type it up there um i i just know a couple of things i don't have a convenient way of entering thorn here um mm -hmm. so but if you are looking up um something where you you want a thorn if you use an underscore that stands for anything so you can look up Drenger, for example by doing that uh, but yeah, if you look up Drenger, uh, then you get um, that one. And um, this is in English and Danish. So the, the English definition comes second here. Uh, and you can see the this uh, one of the earliest manuscripts that record this word is the is Alexander Saga, which is a translation of the um, uh, Latin Alexandres, um, and here, uh, I'm not quite sure which word it's translating here. Well, let's see. So, well, well, he says, let's let's die as befits Drangers. So I guess it's, yeah. the, I guess it's the Onesto More. Onesto, yeah. Could be the the forte. So I, I need I need a Latinist next to me too. I can always figure out the yes. word. But... <laughs> next time <laughs> we'll just bring along our pocket Latinist and uh, pocket they Latinist, can. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So what uh, so what you have here? Uh, yeah, is the definition the citations that belong to that definition. Um, and then you start getting phrasal uses of it too. So Gozer Drenger, a, a good, good guy. I mean, Drenger already means a great guy, right? So Gozer Drenger is a great, great guy. Right. Um, and so you get, oops, I just clicked on one accidentally. Um, how do I go back? Oh, no, I've just, uh, yep. Uh, so there, So then you get that collocation that, you know, and you can see that actually, there are even more citations where Gulddrenger go together than just Drenger. And uh, some other kind of phrases, uh, to um, have the courage to do something um, and, uh, and so on. And then you start to get what is the, uh, the sort of more modern uh, use in Scandinavian, Ungerdrenger, where it specifically means a young man or a boy. Um, translating Juvenis here in, in Latin, mm -hmm. and it, uh, and then some of the less common senses of it. Um, yeah, that's an, a, that's, mm -hmm. that's an amazing uh, feature that you can look at these phrasal collocations, uh, because I mean, right here, as you pointed out, you see just how common that collocation go the Drenger is, right, and that's. Yeah. You know, in, intuitively, that sounds right to me as a reader of Old Norse, but I, I wouldn't otherwise see the numbers, right? And that's and it's just that's an amazingly frequent collocation. Yeah, maybe I should put the numbers in, <laughs> oh, that'd be so you can make those make those generalizations with a bit more uh, fact behind them. Um, I, I mean, sometimes when you get down to the 
bottom, you get some really obscure things like here. It also means a rope with which the foremost bottom corner of a square sail is attacked to the tacking boom. Wow. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of nautical term, terms that don't come up very often, but uh, it's, um, yeah, interesting. Um, there is some sort of, uh, you, you can also sort all the sites citations by the date of the manuscript, for example. Um, so that's the the earliest one is actually uh, in the Icelandic uh, homily book uh, and then and then so on down there. So you know that's interesting to see and also alphabetically by the source if you're looking for something. But I should also point out there's a lot of other information here uh, um, that under this comp gloss lit thing. And this is a little bit of a gesture to the original printed volumes of the dictionary, which had these abbreviations. But the comp is compounds, gloss is uh, glossaries and dictionaries, and lit is secondary literature. So if you click on that, you can see all of the forms that the word takes. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it's interesting to see how the, the spelling develops over time. The compounds that have this as its last element. So in a dictionary, it's obviously difficult. It's easy to look up compounds where the first part is the same, but harder to look up something where uh, it's it's the second part that's the same. Mm -hmm. So we have a list of all of the compounds that have drenger as the second element. Uh, and you can just click through to those. Uh, which I won't do in case I can't find my way back. Um, and all of the dictionaries that have the word, uh, there should be more information here, but you know these these um, are places where you can also see it. So if you want to look up the etymology under De Vries and that one. And then um, there's been there's obviously a lot of literature about this particular word because it's you know it's quite interesting uh it, it turns up a lot on rune stones it's you know it's a it's a good word um and uh the genre kind of uh, distribution so oh. it occurs a lot in family sagas historical works but less in you know religious works and um some of the other things uh, that, yeah, where you would expect it to, well, where as a proportion of the corpus, it, it comes less often. And then there are phrases which have fruit under other entries that have this word. So again, so golder drenger um, also turns up under golder good. Uh, so you can just click through there. And you can, if you click here, you can even see how the word is distributed in the manuscripts over time. That's awesome. Uh, so this, yeah, it's a bit hard to kind of use these graphs. This is the whole corpus, how everything is distributed over time. So it's fairly close to what you'd expect, but more, more of uh, the Islanding Asoga, the orange ones than the whole corpus, the corpus as a whole, for example, and less of the religious works, which you sort of expect. But it's interesting, for example, that you can see from this that it's a that it shows up in a bigger portion of the family sagas corpus than legendary sagas corpus. Right, that's interesting. Yeah. I wouldn't have necessarily thought about that. Uh, it 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 seems then to be. I, I wonder if it feels like a more contemporary word to the people writing the sagas and doesn't feel like it fits in the sort of more archaic world of the legendary saga sometimes to to someone writing in the 1200s or 1300s. That's well, maybe the other way around because of course a lot of the legendary sagas uh, uh, got that influence from uh, continental uh, romance uh, hmm. literature. And, you know, it's kind of an old fashioned or possibly even, you know, it might start to sound old fashioned or derogatory uh, to talk <laughs> about a warrior as a dranger. Although, when you think about it, knight, knicht, that's an old English word that means boy. Um, so it might just be a different kind of vocabulary that they're using in those texts to express the same things. Yeah. Whereas in the, you know, is in the family sagas, they might be using more of the traditional terms. But but the very fact that we can think to ask these questions is is thanks to the, the huge amount of data 
that you and other people at the ONP have collected here. I mean, this this is it is just amazing to see how much you can say yeah, about one word. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, you'd hope so because it's had a lot of people working for a very long time. Yeah, uh, and uh, and you know, one of the fun things that about my job since I started at the dictionary is trying to get this stuff out because it was just it was lying there in this database and had been collected meticulously for years, but they didn't necessarily have a way of. I mean, they used it themselves to kind of make decisions about what words mean meant, but it wasn't always coming out uh, in a way that, you know, could be useful for for just interested people out there. Well, thank you very much for getting it out more and more as 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 the years pass. I mean, there's already more of it than, than there was when I was in grad school. Uh, yeah. I dare. I, I I feel like it's it's probably like an impolite question to ask when it might be all ready, <laughs> but but uh, when it might be ready. Yeah, the whole. Yeah, well, I think to... we, we're on <laughs> we're on track to do it in my working lifetime, okay. uh, which is as long as you might think. I and mean, my my aim is twenty years. Um, <laughs> but what I actually hope to do in that time is not only finish that but also bring in all of the, the poetry and maybe even the, the runic material that, oh, wow. that fits into the period. The, like the Iceland, later Icelandic and Norwegian runic material, because um, otherwise you're basically dealing with a different language. Mm -hmm. um, That's ambitious. Yeah. That's extremely ambitious. And I, and I hope to see it. Well, <laughs> Well, I mean, what, look, the, the, there's a lot that's changed uh, in terms of technology. And, you know, you, you wouldn't do a dictionary this way now. Uh, if you look at the old English dictionary, for example, which started in the computer age, uh, they basically digitized everything and then and then used that as a tool. So, but, uh, but, you know, we have, we have a lot more tools at our disposal now. There's, there's a lot more, less just going through papers and papers. Uh, the fact that we have, you know, just the edition page there when we go to read the, you know, to, to, um, to uh, try and understand a citation is, uh, is already an enormous help. And, and then we're linking in more and more stuff, translations and other things. So it is getting easier, um, and so yeah, it's it's good to to kind of ramp up your ambitions as as you're you get better at it as well, mm. because you know, ultimately it'll make for a better product. What well, is much appreciated? Could, can can I uh, give you some questions from patron supporters in the chat? Yeah, go for it. Oh, I've got the chat on the shared screen, I'll, don't I? <laughs> yeah, I, I can read them to you so that we got. That'll also help when I post this publicly so people can hear the question. Uh, yep. So Heike asks, when you read a word in an old manuscript, how do you know how it was spelled as there are no recordings? So how it was spelled or how it was pronounced, I guess. Yeah, I'm not I'm not quite sure what the context is there. Um, well, uh, we know how it was spelled because, um, I mean, it's very inconsistent. You can see that up here, that even mm -hmm. just the form Drenga is spelled here, like mostly like this, but then with an I. Um, and um, yeah, and, and in later manuscripts with UR and a Y and all sorts of things. Uh, so, uh, but you know, it, it follows it follows particular patterns, um, and you kind of know that when you're dealing with younger manuscripts, then it's going to just look a bit different. And you, you, we know the sound changes that were happening that produced the new the new spellings, and also the scribal practices that produced different ways of writing the same thing. Um, but we. You know, we, we're almost always confident we know which word it is. I mean, I guess that's another question too. Um, like, how do you know if you encounter something that's called drengur, that it's not something else entirely that's actually spelt D-R-E-Y or pronounced D-R-E-Y and G-A right. or something? Um, and it is, uh, you know, it still happens. When you go through these uh, articles where you go, that's a different word. 
and it's been put in the wrong place. Uh, but again, you know, there are lots of um, lots of clever people whose eyes look over these things, uh, and you know, sometimes I, I kind of scratch my head and it's like, you know, I said to one of my colleagues, like Tobo, I cannot work this out. What the hell does this mean? And she's like, oh, that's a different word. <laughs> I was like, okay, so I don't need to deal with it. It goes into a different pile. So yeah, we 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 also um, review. Uh, you know, sometimes words belong in the wrong place. Sometimes words that we thought were words actually are just different forms of um, uh, of something that already is there, and it turns out not to be a word. So a word list is about twice as long as what's actually in the dictionary because Obviously. there are different spellings, there are different, you know, words that only occur in poetry, there are words that other people thought were words and we don't think are words actually but belong to another word, that kind of thing. And as a follow-up on that, is is there ever any kind of uncertainty about how to uh, how to display the head word, right, about what particular spelling one would one would use where a word is spelled like like okay maybe an example might be like nokor where i've seen just you know so many different yeah. uh variations nekbear and nakvar and nukur and... what have we got there uh nukur. let's try and go there yeah that's yeah, what so it ends up looking like <laughs> uh it's so yeah we uh so the the best um, the best method is to put everything in because people will okay. will look up. Uh, I mean, people want to be able to look up nakvar, for example, and find the word that we've edited. So it's important that we have all of these variants. Uh, some of them are really quite obscure, like this nukur at the end. Mm -hmm. I don't know where, who would ever look up try to look this up as nukur. Um, so, but what comes first is is I guess the the sort of well established um, the well established kind of uh, classical orthography that we we're used to seeing, uh, but yeah, I mean it's not it's not always that straightforward, and sometimes it can be a bit inconsistent. Like when you've got things that have been going for many many years and by different people, I do occasionally get emails from people that say. You spell it this way here, but in this entry, it's spelled that way. What's going on? And it's like, oh. Well, and of course, some of that is is probably an artifact of people looking at the citations themselves, which, as you can see here, show just this cornucopia yeah, yeah, of different manuscript one. spellings. Yeah, yeah, right. It's fantastic, <laughs> isn't it? Nick Kure Kori. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like, ultimately we like it's important to have this documentation of the language but, but most people who are using the dictionary are just trying to understand words and texts so ultimately uh they should be going back to the editions and the manuscripts um and that's why we've got all of that that information there i think it's great uh magdalena asks the amount of information is absolutely astounding so is there ever an end to this project or oh, can we I've already had that end? question yeah but, <laughs> but I mean I my question was question more like every 20 seconds but yeah my, my question was more like when will you know all of the entries be searchable in the same way and have the same information but is there is there ever a point where you say no we've done it this this is the end of old Norse <laughs> <laughs> well well uh yeah well there's the 20 year kind of thing but it's there's there's material on absolutely everything in here. There'll be something. So the things that we haven't got onto at all yet are, for example, compound nouns after F. Um, so I don't know what, what we would have there. Yeah. So if you go to, yeah, theory bending. So this is, this is a word that hasn't been edited, um, but you still get... Um, the uh, a list of the other dictionaries it's in, so you can look them up. Mm -hmm. You get uh, the citations that have been put under this word. Of course, it might change a bit if we decide that this isn't a word or something. Um, but uh, you can see you can see where it is, 
And crucially, I think if you're if you're looking for a word's meaning that hasn't been finished, is that we have a lot of material from older dictionaries already here. Hmm. So um, for English speakers, Cleesby and Zoega are the main um, the main ones we use, and uh, I've got the digital versions of those linked in um, in almost all cases here. Oh, okay. So if you click on that, you get Cleesby's definition. I mean, so Uyghur is just a short version of Cleesby and Bigfusson. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it means foreboding. So we we haven't edited it yet, but uh, it's unlikely that that's going to change much. Um, Fritzner, which is the biggest completed dictionary, is also there. He His dictionary is in Dano-Norwegian, but that also works to click on it. Um, so, so there you can see his uh, for Vassal in, mm. uh, in Norwegian is forewarning, which is more or less the same as foreboding, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and oh. um, they've only got this reference to there. It, it, what's also interesting is that I've also linked in the editions that uh, the older dictionaries used. So you can you can kind of go through to the the text that Fritzner and Cleesby was using. It should be the same one um, uh, when they, they were making their dictionary. So there's a lot. Of, so there's already a lot of information there. We have Blundell's dictionary that isn't working in this case. Um, and we've linked in uh, some of the resources at Maulith Punctum East, oh, wow, uh, the, which is uh, so you can see um, that it turns up in the from the 17th to 19th centuries in younger works, and also the um, the <laughs> complete declension of a word that the, you know that doesn't actually occur in any historical work uh, work in most of these forms. But anyway. Um, it's useful to have that. And in some, like for most words that are more common than this, there's, uh, it's also linked to the Scaldic project. Uh, so most of the poetry and a few texts from Minota as well. And in those cases, I'll just, I'll just see if this works. I'm sorry, I, I feel like I'm dominating this and you need to That's interrupt more. That's the idea. More or <laughs> but what you're, what you're okay. telling me, what, you, what you're telling me is that even where the entry is nowhere near complete, it's still the most useful Old Norse dictionary available. <laughs> yeah, you can always is, start with us, even if you yeah. don't finish with us. That's, uh, right. that, that's my goal anyway. Uh, so yeah, here, the, the second element of that bending, you can see uh, is turns up in a few other, there's a few of these Minota, which is a big uh, digital editing project. And the Skaldic project even has, um, the translations normally here. This is from a religious poem of the 12th century, Gaisley. And if you click through there, you even get the full <laughs> translation um, and, um, uh, and the, the full text. That's incredibly useful to have that cross-referencing with the Skaldic project. I mean, yeah. that, that, that almost belies the, the prose in the dictionary's title already, just to have that yeah, such such easy access to that material. Yeah. Well, like I say, it, it, uh, hopefully it's your, your, your first stop uh, on to finding out more. And I mean, it's not that I don't want you to find other resources out there because they're fantastic. And I've always, I've always got the links in so that you can go mm -hmm. to where these came from, like uh, Scott Burt's new site, which isn't working. I better <laughs> go back for a yeah. Okay. Great. Oh, um, yeah. Well, okay. It's just, it's, yeah. Well, let, let me ask another question here from, from Marie, uh, who says, this is amazing when teasing out the meaning of a word, especially a hot box, is it ever necessary to look at etymological relations and other cognates or do the editors rely entirely on context? Um, no, we, we, <laughs> You use whatever you can. I mean, mm. it is sometimes really a struggle to work out uh, what these words mean um, when you're going through them. Uh, you know, uh, none of us are experts in all of the literature that we're dealing with. So, um, you know, whatever whatever definition we choose has to fit the context. 
but to get to that point we use we use the etymological dictionaries other dictionaries modern you know modern icelandic um, and cognates we use translations if we really can't or if we are at least interested in how other people have interpreted it um, and of course the parallels um, the the foreign parallels if it's translated literature uh, are also extremely useful which is why we have them there hmm. and uh, Robert asks, if you search for a form of a word, e.g. gek, will the search point you correctly to the head word, e.g. ganga? I don't think so. But that, I mean, in that case, it does. But that is a very common um, variant, uh, like a, a bleak form. Um, but what you can do is look up the word forms themselves in the citation search here. Uh, so that will also look up the manuscript form. So if we hmm. look up that funny one, I think was it like a V? That? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was. So you can even find the most obscure things, like what the hell does this mean? You might be yeah. able to find it. This okay, way. Well, cool. Um, that's that's perfect. Yeah. So it's it's not foolproof, but uh, most things will be will be findable that way. That's that's an amazing say, tool. If you, if you want to do fun things like um, you know try and find what's the old Norse word for something, that's another thing that I, I can that you can plug in in the chat and um, and Jackson can send to me, is you can use this uh, definition search. So. Um, so if you just put in an English word, help me, I have no imagination. All right, what, what, what do people want to look up? Sword, Sistella. It should come up. Well, it comes up with a lot of things because, you know, it occurs mm. in, uh, you know, collocations to draw and things. But you get a few interesting things like Merki is a very interesting word for a sword. Sphere, of course, which is a sword. Um, the reason why it's not showing anything here is because it's looking for an automatic translation of the Danish definition here. Hmm. Um, but it will still take you through. Uh, and there are some others that are basically um, uh, probably pretty much only found in poetry. But yeah, so if you put in sword, you look down the list and you'll see something like sphere that looks like sword and there you are. And it's worth uh, noting for those who don't uh, have experience with modern Scandinavian that the SB that you're seeing there in many of the entries is substantive, it's noun. Oh yeah. Um, and then that's followed by MF or N for the gender. Just as a quick user mm -hmm. note. And then I see that you have in a noun entry like that also in brackets, you can see the genitive ending and then semicolon and then the plural ending, which in this case, because it's a neuter is nothing. So yeah. that's a that's helpful little inflectional information that's built right there in the entry. Just something worth worth noting. Um, let's see, there was another question I saw just right here. And then there was some chat. Uh, Marie said, why separate prose and poetry in a lexicon? Is it just a matter of specifying what sorts of citations are being used, or is there a substantial difference in the kinds of definitions that would be produced? Um, yeah, the, 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 it, is, it is quite different. Um, if you, a word like sword is fairly simply sword. So these translations are from the Skaldic project. Um, but there is there are, there's quite a big vocabulary that's only found in poetry. Some of the senses can be older. So um, if I go back to Drenger, um, that's uh, yeah, well, I guess there hmm, that's a bit uh, a bit of a mix, but um, the one of the big differences, though, is that a word like sword in poetry is 
almost never going to be used to mean sword. It will usually be in a kenning, in a kind of uh, circumlocution for something else, like a wielder of the sword for a warrior or, or something like that. So, um, so there's a lot of nuances there. There's a lot of there are a lot of words in poetry um, that have have this structure and um, and you know very sort of metaphorical kind of structures. Uh, and there's a lot of in order to kind of fit the the metrical requirements. Um, there's a lot of words that just come up uh, only in poetry or, or are very rare or used slightly differently. As, I mean, as poetry in any kind of language is like, they use words a bit more creatively. So often the, the senses are a bit uh, more general. But where, where there's, um, sometimes we have in dictionary entries where there is a particular poetic sense of the word, we'll, we'll show that there's a poetic sense, even though we don't have citations. Um, mm. But yeah, hopefully eventually it will all be merged together and you can see more easily which uh, which senses belong to poetry and which don't and which words um, only are found in the poetry. There are many, many thousands of words that are only found in the poetry. And of course, just having the poetry, the, the poetic lexicon right next to the prose lexicon without a distinction between them might give give a distorted idea of what the language's default lexicon looks like in some ways, right? If if you see Sferth and like Maikir right next to each other, as it were, as words for sword, mm -hmm. you might not get a good sense of what the sort of normal word is for it. Well, the, a, a very easy way of, um, if we look at that, look up that way, a very easy way of working out what is the most likely word for sword is um, to see how many citations it mm -hmm. has. Yeah, but that doesn't help that <laughs> with Merki because that's, uh, yeah. Oh, I see. And here, in fact, uh, um, there is a word Merki that's used for sword, I think, in poetry, but here it's uh, for a, um, a marking on a sword, mm -hmm. uh, which is only found in um, the, um, the uh, in one legal code um yeah so it's it's a bit tricky but uh, and it's a very kind of vague search but it's it's there for um for you to help users find things according to concept rather than having to know the old norse word first mm -hmm. and by the way we've taken about an hour of your time at this point so if you That's need to go at some point just 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 let us know i i was curious to see how you handled some words where there might be some some controversy or some different ideas about uh about meaning and of course yeah. um you know i did my dissertation work on color in old norris and so i kind of waded into the whole blauer thing you know is it blue is it mm -hmm. black I, I wanted to see how you handled that yeah <laughs> uh are you thinking about uh, um yeah okay well let's Let's look up Blau. We this word of the day thing comes up automatically, and uh, Blauma that came up a couple of months ago, and it was translated in a very old-fashioned way. Let's say um, Blauma there is a, basically a, a black person, um, but um, but unfortunately the editors back in the nineties had used words that I think should have seemed pretty outdated already back in the nineties. But anyway, um, we fixed that up. Uh, okay, yeah, so here um, we've just copped out by referring to the secondary literature. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, there's a lot of instances of the world. So blue or blue black or black, a distinction between the two can often not be drawn. Um, I guess in when you go down to, um, oh, isn't that interesting? It should have nicknames, but. Uh, the Harold Bluetooth isn't here. Hmm. I wonder what's going on there. Anyway, um, yeah. So that's that's how that's handled, which is pretty much, I guess, it's a little bit of a cop out. Um, but if you can't make the 
the distinction, then I suppose it's better not to to kind of make a claim which then you know someone else um, it can uh, you know just, just say oh the dictionary is wrong. I mean I see here that you've got by the svatr or blau, mm. which would and suggest iris ever blau, but but the, yeah. the nice the nice thing is too that of course you can look at this and say okay well the dictionary doesn't commit on you know one side of this line, but then I have right there in front of me my own means to to say yeah, oh okay exactly. this is what, what i think because i can see all what all the entries uh, are yeah look at the entries and and you can also make arguments like um that yeah on the basis that in a similar text it's used in this way or in this collocation by looking through it i mean we can't do all of that work for you right. um <laughs> yeah that's i think a... that means like uh um and uh yeah there are whereas yeah for a bruised flesh is obviously the color of a bruise uh, which is kind of blue um yeah blau rock blue black and blue uh, we would say in english wouldn't we um which is yeah interesting so it's, it's the yeah that's a fascinating word of course Well, that is, I mean, I think that that's a reasonable way of handling. <laughs> just, uh, just a word that I've waded into a lot of the, the, uh, I guess, controversy over. I was trying to think of something else where there might be some, some disagreement about it, a definition, but that was the the first word that came to mind. Yeah, no, that's a good one, and I think, but it, I suppose the some of them, you know, like uh, I'm just going to look up. Where there's hmm. where it's kind of like ergi. That's there's not actually, uh, you know, that's that's an interesting one because this concept of effeminacy or like most people, I think, who've you know read the literature would would immediately think of the second definition here, mm -hmm. um, and the asterisk here means that we're not entirely sure, but. Um, but in fact, most of them um, just seem to, most of the uses just seem to say, yeah, say, mean horny effectively, yeah. uh, which isn't what you'd necessarily um, think of. Interesting. Uh, well, and that's a, and that itself is, is fascinating to see because, of course, you know, a more prurient use or something might stick out in the memory more. But just to see yeah. that that's actually not numerically the most common usage of a word. That's very interesting. And the adjective um, too. I mean, yeah, because I think I remember looking at this myself and thinking, oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Because most of these are just basically negative. Uh, it just basically means something negative. Um, but, um, but you know, in, in some contexts, like um, my my um, you know all boys school education, a word like this, which we would normally think of meaning effeminate, uh, you know, uh, is is basically a generic insult to anyone. So, mm. oh, such and such is a bufta. It doesn't suggest that they're actually effeminate or have sex with men or something. It just means loser or right, right. Or, or something like that. But, um, and then of course this uh, huh. I mean, this right here is interesting. I, I wouldn't have necessarily anticipated that the Rager spelling was so much more common than the Arger one. Yeah, isn't uh, that? I, I intuitively would have said, oh, they occur about as often as the other, but Rager seems actually to occur a lot more. Huh. Yeah, I mean, it's not, the citation count isn't, isn't a, a statistical survey, it's what people have selected, but generally it reflects the frequency. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, once again, it's, uh, you would, you would think that um, this one um, would be the, the sense that most of us would think of first, whereas it's not actually the most common sense where it, um, it, you know, it generally just means, yeah, someone who's not living up to 
their expectations of um, of bravery or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and here like again, really or something. And here again, we see the uh, the very useful collocation feature with like re- ruidero curagar. Uh, yeah, that's. Right. Well, and gate. Gates. I was wondering about that. <laughs> why, why is a goat particular? Well, I guess goats are kind of well, a female goat. goat. I mean, gate uh, is uh, is a uh, is a nanny goat, isn't it? I suppose. Oh, okay, I said uh, Havor. Yeah, but like, I, I guess a goat would be kind of cowardly. I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. But razor or rather, why why red and red and wimpy? or something i don't know when you're wimpy maybe you get bloody uh, isn't isn't that in hames kringla yeah i yes. see it's actually the last citation there a this it's a, effectively the same sentence it's in three different versions yeah oh um, we and the, yeah a, a proverb and huh. mm. uh max asks is the thing with many different spellings of the same word unique uh, for Old Norse, or does it happen with other old languages? I'd say you see it in a lot of. Oh languages. yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Middle English is notorious for this, which is a, from a similar period. I mean, basically any language that didn't have a, a a kind of very codified official status was people just spelt it how they thought it should be spelt, um, and that applies to most vernacular languages in the Middle Ages. So anything that's not Latin, more or less. Um, so yeah, Middle English is uh, is also extremely variable. Um, yeah, blows mm-hmm. blows your head a bit. I mean, look, if you read Shakespeare in the original uh, editions, it it is also very variable in the spelling. Um, it looks very different from what you would have read in school. It, uh, so you know this is happening in all languages until we get to the early modern period when or the later modern period when uh, when people are starting to go no let's let's be consistent about this and the first dictionaries were coming out and for that matter if we were doing more like these medieval writers and spelling according to our own pronunciations you would see a lot of this variation even in english today like what is spelled e i t h e r i say either right yeah. you might say either if we were actually spelling it according to our pronunciations you would see two different words but we right using one yeah. standard spelling so that's that that kind of height well, and american spellings are full of more uh, phonetic things than we have in in british and australian english for example like center which we write re which is not how it's pronounced <laughs> right true so even sometimes those variant spellings don't reflect pronunciation but just tradition yeah exactly. which is its own its own question um and actually kind of comes back to something that Heike had asked about how do you know how a word was pronounced? And I mean, there's a lot of answers to how we try to get at this, triangulating from modern descendants, um, looking at how Latin is spelled at about this time, because of course the spelling of medieval languages is usually based on the language of which they first encounter the Roman alphabet, which is, is Latin in, the, in this case, um, or Old English in the case of missionaries to Scandinavia. Um, but sometimes, you know, with a case like this, like maybe Raga versus Arger, we wouldn't necessarily know if maybe someone says it the other way, but learn to spell it, you know, this way. And so yeah. it just sort of reverses the order of the R and the A from what he's actually saying. Um, that yeah. kind of thing is probably impossible to get to. Or then you have in- instances that I think are kind of interesting where like the privative prefix, the un prefix, right? You sometimes see O. And sometimes you see ooh, mm. and sometimes mm-hmm. that can seem regional, but then sometimes one shows up where I wouldn't expect it, right? Like I kind yeah. of, I kind of think of the ooh as being more Norwegian and the o as being more Icelandic, but I've seen the ooh in Iceland, and Klesby Vikfusson kind of notoriously, in my opinion, decides that ooh is better. Yeah, <laughs> it's all the entries of the ooh. Uh, irritating when you're a student. It's like, why the hell is this word? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, that's no, a, that's, I, uh, uh, yeah. that's a decision I never understood. Um, no, and why? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of strange things, but you know, it's also yeah, it was the project that um, 
well, you know, it, it's m most of the work. Well, I think probably most of the work was done in Copenhagen, uh, and then asked after Cleesby's death that uh, it got um, it got shifted to Oxford, and then Vicfusson took over it. So I think there are a lot of a lot of changes in the the methods that were happening because there wasn't just one kind of um, set of people or person that was deciding how it should be done. And that was mostly uh, Guth van der Vickerson and Konrad Gieselson, right? Were the two people? I suspect Konrad did most of the proper work on it, actually. Mm. I think uh, uh, Guth van der Vickerson, um obviously put in a lot of modern Icelandic meanings and, and things like that. But I, I don't get the strong impression that he was he was doing the sort of legwork in the, the difficult um, bits, which... Uh, the big verbs and even in um uh, the first preface to in the first edition of the dictionary it's quite clear that conrad did most of the work on the big verbs and that's the really hard bit of a dictionary uh, oh, of this, sure. these languages because they have yeah i mean if you go to uh, uh, gongo or drago or something yeah that would, it'd be interesting to look at one of these yeah 1438 citations <laughs> You know, this is what the entry looks like. All Tons of, D, of K, and then uh, all of the phrasal uses and uh, so on and and so forth. And then the reflexive and the middle voice and yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a lot of work. <laughs> By the way, I I just noticed something that uh, I feel like. Uh... Uh, what's the word validates or vindicates me a little bit is I noticed that the I umlaut of long O is spelled in entries in, in normalized entries as O slash with an acute, which I vastly yeah. prefer to the OE ligature because the OE ligature is so easily confused with ash and italics. Yeah, no, it's a, that was a decision made early on. And um, like in that one, no, I mean no. So that's the wrong way. But yeah, it's uh, it makes more sense because it's the long version of O with a slash. Right. Right. Uh, what's an example? Uh, I I vastly prefer it, and and I, I decided to use it starting with my first publications. But I, I've always felt like I'm kind of a like a weird know, minority. It's, but it's it's really vindicating yeah. to see it here. <laughs> well, like like uh, laggy, right? Like laughter or something like that. Uh, what was the word? Sorry. Like what would be a modern Icelandic laggy, pai, like laughter, H L, uh, long O slash. Wouldn't that be long O slash? All right, what's a yeah, 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 yeah. like oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, see, that's very vindicating. <laughs> yeah. so, so thank you. <laughs> it, may, it certainly makes it easier to explain when you do it that way. And of course, the OE ligature is not something that you ever get in a manuscript anywhere. Uh, right. It's just a sort of modern invention to make the distinction. Uh, yeah. Not that what you get in the manuscripts is necessarily all that much more consistent, as you can see in these various citations. Uh, mm -hmm. But I yeah. really love that right away when you're looking at citations, you're getting exposed to that reality of just yeah. how various these spellings are because it it really kind of removes the you know the 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 sort of standardized spelling for an ancient language is great as a learning tool but once you're actually encountering texts it's so important to remember that um, these were not people who were working with spell check next to them and uh, yeah. that there can be information that we can't even anticipate that maybe a scholar down the road notices from from the pattern and the way that something mm -hmm. is spelled and realizes, oh, these are actually two different words, or this is a subjunctive that we didn't realize. Was, who knows? Um, but it's great to yeah. have all that data there, just in case. <laughs> and here you can see, because the citations are, are ordered according to the date of the manuscript, you can actually see that phonological change that's happening, because the sound uh, in which we say flai as if it was modern Icelandic, is because that sound became the same as the one that we write with the AE lit mm -hmm. ligature in the in the middle of the 13th century, and so these these texts um, they you you can see that in the early ones it's per, it's spelt 
the old way and then something changes and now it looks like how it does in modern Icelandic. Uh, once you get into the 14th century uh, manuscripts like Hulda and Flatter book. And I noticed that with, with Drenger looking at manuscript date, of course, you start to see that diphthongs show up, even though that's not reflected in modern Icelandic spelling. Yeah, it is yeah, pronounced yeah. that way. And you start to see it showing up in, in some people's spellings and in, in later manuscripts. That's it's really cool to watch that happen. Yeah. And this is a nice, a nice example, because it's, you know, a nice, uh, uh, manageable seven citations. But even with something like Traga, right, with a few thousand citations, you're seeing uh, recognizable patterns if you organize it by date. You know, you start yeah. seeing this far bhakti vowels come in. Uh, things like that that's that's so cool yeah well, would you like to uh you have any other tips or tricks to show us from a, a user end because I, I feel like you've shown us so many yeah uh, i i don't want i mean i think you you can sort of go into it from various perspectives like looking at the manuscripts uh and you can you can then go through and see whoa. what citations come from each manuscript um, but one of the really useful things is this thing that I've called ONP reader which is where where we have uh, permission to reproduce the edition so if it's out of copyright like this one we can actually have the text and the citations alongside it so you can use this as a kind of running glossary uh, for hmm. a work. So if you're looking at, um, if you if you want to read some old Norse, uh, this work, like we're using unnormalized editions. So it tends to be more useful if you're a little bit used to old Norse and you can work your way through it. Uh, but but then you if if we have the text and that's in the majority of cases, then you can can come to something like this so where you know locked here in the second line it actually has the uh, definition that we have and the phrasal the phrase that it occurs in and things and you can actually so you can use it to to read um almost any old norse prose text in fact that's incredible. Uh, and the, and especially the idiom being right there um you know, if, if you're using Please Be Vickerson as a PDF or something, you're maybe control Fing through, you know, the entry for Bera or something <laughs> to try to find the particular idiom. Yeah. That's that's an incredible. I mean, it only works for the things that we've actually edited, but uh, but that's you know, I mean, that's a good proportion of the things that you might not already know what it means. Uh, and for the other ones, you can just click through for the um, the dictionary entry itself, and you have to work it out for yourself uh, if it's if it's not been selected. Uh, so that's that's quite a nice uh, thing if you're actually just trying to read a work and want to work out what it is. I've used this in reading groups and things in teaching where you know, so you the the students have some of the words glossed alongside them without me having to do any work, which is <laughs> it's always nice. Uh, and if you have a bit of old Norse, um, there's this wordle uh, the the word game app, um, which you uh, say so guess a five letter word of the day. Um, uh, so you know, can give yourself a go. It's hard. It's so, hard. I mean, I've, well, I, what is your favorite starting word? I, mine has been getur, or, or that's actually my modern Icelandic one with, um, okay, Reva. So I cheated, Jackson, I cheated. I did a statistical search on the database that's for which perfect. were the letters that were the most common in five letter words. <laughs> and um, it was <laughs> uh, S R E I D N A. Um, so, uh, and then I searched for which were the most common in each position, and I came up with Reva. <laughs> oh so I usually start with Reva. Um, and you can see already today that's that's got us a long way towards the solution. And another good one is uh, is say that. Okay. Um, no, but there's but no today that well. Yeah. So mm. yeah, I start with Reva. But, you know, at one stage, I was looking through the logs um, at uh, how people were going with it. And, um, you know, it's all anonymized. But, uh, but yeah, 
there's maybe only 10% of people actually can solve it. Can this so there's be, a challenge for your listeners. Can, can this be throw though, maybe? Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna put my old nurse wordle skills to test right uh, here. What was it? I, I did it today. Uh this could be uh, further, like the genitive plural of, of modern Icelandic Friday. So F R it's it's uh, I'm so I guess you would have to use the one below that, right? The O slash. Yeah, right. Because because you ignore uh, long marks, right? Okay, so I'm not still not getting uh, that. Uh, this is uh, my honor is on the line. Um, yeah, I can't, I did it today. It took me five attempts, and now I've completely forgotten what it was. Was it? I think I tried to breathe that, but that wasn't right either. Like decorate? No, it was that. Oh, it is yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Breather. Because this is the thing. There's a lot of kind of re- this is this is a word that comes up a lot in religious literature. There's a, mm-hmm. you know you don't necessarily think of. Um, all of the most common five letter words when you think in your head it depends a lot on what you're used to reading but uh yeah so i've got it even even when i had already solved it it took me (laughs) by our combined powers we did it in five (laughs) yeah because i I let it choose it randomly so i can actually play this every day without actually knowing um the solution but there is a there is a little cheat button here that um that uh you know uh-huh. gives you some suggestions based you know to narrow it down if you don't have the whole of old Norse vocabulary in your head uh, already i think it's awesome it's a it's a great vocabulary tool um yeah yeah it's pretty... i mean how many how many words in old norse are are five letter trochees or can be in some inflectional form quite a few so it's a great way to just remind yourself of some word you might otherwise not encounter very often. Yeah. Oh, and and uh, I have one of my patron supporters pointing out, I, I do monthly Old Norse office hours where I take uh, mm-hmm. supporters questions and, and look at texts that they're translating and things like that. And she points out that the manuscript feature would be really cool to do for an office hour because we could pick a passage and work on it without having to, uh, well, with the, the sort of looking up a lot of that work done for you. Yeah, uh, if you're just unfamiliar with the word, if you don't know what the head word is, yeah, it's that there's a hundred things that could be done with the tools here. Um, yeah. and I really appreciate you giving us this tour and also talking about, uh, I was particularly interested in the lexicographic work behind it too and, and, and what that looks mm-hmm. like. Um, one day I have to, uh, I don't know, visit the, the ONP offices or something and see what this, this really looks like behind the scenes. Yeah, well, one day we we had this plan before Corona uh, on our 80th birthday or soon afterwards to go and visit the Middle English Dictionary in Michigan because um, the this dictionary was was based on that or its methods when it started because that was the state of the art dictionary uh, in in the 1930s. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's 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 interesting. Um, it's really. Yeah, a fascinating kind of project to do. And and Stella points out the list of proverbs. Could you show us that real quick? Oh yeah, there's a lot of under this info thing. There's a lot of um, just stuff that I've collected basically out of the database. So these are words that are marked as proverbs um, in or sentences that are marked as proverbs in the dictionary and i think you should be able to click through yeah uh not all of them have been translated um but there are these cf uh, things are different um reference works that have collected them um who's the guy in your part of the world that's collecting proverbs well there was someone who had a website for a long yeah, time. I think George Tate was doing it, but I don't think we use those. But yeah. I think I think I have it bookmarked. Let me see. Um Proverbs and Sagas. It looks like it's at the Department of English at the University of Saskatchewan. Yeah, that sounds right. But I don't see a name because it looks like the website's actually gone that I had bookmarked. So I don't oh, know. Okay. But well that's 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 really cool. And so you just have a uh 
that's something you can index, like tag it as a proverb when you see a, a phrase that is. Well, if you if you click through, you can see there's there's a a field in the database where we kind of sometimes categorize the word if it's a legal word or proverbial or something else and uh, so it's just using that so it's not very um, systematic hmm. uh, and I think you know in the future what what would probably be a good idea is if somebody is doing some sort of research project on proverbs is that they go through and add that information or pro produce it in a way that we can use it in the dictionary then and like with um, you know the stuff that we link at the bottom so we don't necessarily say this is that the dictionary has made a decision that this is a proverb but if you're interested in proverbs this other person has that kind mm -hmm. of thing and may I observe like on this entry i see um uh, you know bisna skal to batna that bisna skal better verdi you know we've got a lot of bees here right so it kind of suggests a, a poetic uh model if nothing else or like a kind of semi poetic structure do you do you also index for alliteration because i could see how that yeah. could change word choice even in prose no no that's interesting isn't it <laughs> just a question uh, you know, it seems like something that, that would oh, be but a... i think well this is just i think two different versions of the same oh, okay. uh, but, thing but, but both... it's still alliterative Beast yeah both are alliterative of... so i'm wondering if that's sometimes going to change what word is chosen even if it's not technically poetry just the desire to alliterate might affect word yeah, choice yeah. and i wonder if like, like the ruther or uh, mm -hmm. example we saw before yeah right. no, that were i mean that that sort of thing i guess you can search for in an automatic way you know what what starts the words you know like phrases where there's alliteration we could probably do some sort of search on um yeah look there's a there's a research project in itself yeah. Well, it, it's uh it's just inspired by when i was doing my database of color terms in old norse i i always noted alliteration even in prose just because i wanted to make sure that that wasn't sometimes affecting what word color was chosen. Yeah. maybe i should maybe i should upload that database somewhere or something i don't know yeah <laughs> yeah um but uh, but that, i mean that sort of thing i mean seriously jackson and i'm sorry we, we're kind of slipping into to shop talk here but that kind of thing is uh, really useful to have is like a concordance of color terms because, of course, you, you can look up red and blue and green in the dictionary, um, but uh, just to be able to produce a list, um, we can do that fairly easily and, uh, and you know, hopefully and, and find some way of crediting the, the person that's the source of it as well. Well, I'll show you what I have. I, I can't even remember what program it's on. It might not even be Excel. It might be something like, you know, Apple numbers. <laughs> so it might take some converting. Uh, yeah. Stoll was asking about the, the place name index. Oh, yeah. Or, or pointing to that. Could, could you show us that too? Was that under here? Okay, yeah. yeah. So basically what's happened here is that the dictionary has collected um, words from like usually these words have been written into somebody else's dictionary uh and so we've basically got our word list of everything that's in all dictionaries so that you can potentially look it up um now there's not um there's not much useful here i guess it's a bit hard to interpret it but what this means is that there is actually a citation um, that doesn't that's never going to be edited by the dictionary but in Stjorden, the uh, biblical translation and here in Thysric's saga um, the the saga of uh, supposedly Theodoric and uh, a, this the saint's life of um, Saint Anna and so on so so there are citations there but um, but I don't have any links. I should look into that. But it's by no means a comprehensive list of place names. And likewise, um, there's also lots of personal names. What's the difference? That looks like exactly the same it list. It looks like the same list. <laughs> well, still, it, it might yeah. be useful just to 
if someone is looking yeah. for occurrences of a place name and they might find something that, that, that one hadn't found before. But yeah. I mean, there's so much there I see on the left that, you know, thesaurus, that's a fascinating idea. Yeah, um, well, this is this is where I'm thinking. I mean, a lot of these, like uh, you're here, the legal terms, um, are those have been tagged in the same way as the um, the proverbs, which hmm. don't appear here. Uh, and I've just collected those, but it's it's a really it's really just the the rudiments of a, a thesaurus. I collected textile terms for a paper I gave um, earlier this year or last year for example, um, which is a bit more comprehensive, but uh, but it's not it's not a proper thesaurus. It's just a sort of tool for putting in things that are interesting at this stage. And that this is this is another project really in itself. We don't have the time to do this. Well, but it's a fascinating step towards some some semantic taxonomy. In Old Norse, mm -hmm. right, for getting words that have that relate to related concepts together, um, potentially enabling some great research projects about you know what counts as as a broke or whatever, right? You know that just just I, I can see a, a hundred different research projects that could come out of just a, a database like this. That's, I mean, I it's it's a little bit raw in terms of the data, but uh, points you toward, of course, these entries that have so much information and citations in them I, I think it's an awesome tool yeah uh, i think the real challenge with these things is for the things that that are sort of beyond what we can do with the project is how we work with other researchers to to kind of make both the material that's in our dictionary available to them in a digital form and make what they or integrate what they do or make that accessible to people using the dictionary um but you know there's there's lots of lots of progress on the technological front there so hopefully we can do more of that in the future well i'm going to be watching this very closely and uh i'll be spreading your gospel <laughs> because this is an amazing tool <laughs> <Please do. laughs> thanks i mean look you know i i think i've done a lot uh, and i think my what i've contributed here is to to make it accessible but a project like this just relies on really smart people working really hard for a really long time Obviously. and um, and that's uh, you know it this is almost nothing you see and hear of the actual information it has much to do with me uh, but it's it's great to to get it out there and, and make it available to people well and this is what we get yeah after 70 years of of hard working smart people dedicated to this I'm I'm blown away by what's available here, and of course I had used the website, but but you know I had only used it in a much more rudimentary way than the way you're showing us here. I hadn't realized all the different ways you could sort the data and the entries, and this is a this is an amazing tool. So thank you, and thank you for the uh, the uh, the the starting word in Old Norse Wordle that will be <laughs> put to good use. <laughs> Yeah, start here. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm, I probably should eat some dinner now. It's uh, eight thirty, and and I'm getting hungry. <laughs> well, yeah, please, please do, and please say hello to uh, to our mutual friends and colleagues in in uh, Helsinki this evening. I'll do that. All right. Hey, thank you so much for your time. And uh, it's my pleasure. Well, from beautiful Colorado, wish you all the best over there. See you later.